Hi, Leslie. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much, David. Really good to see you. Okay, so I know you're interested in a lot of stuff and working on a number of projects. What are um, one or two uh, research projects for you that are top of mind? So right now, there are actually two separate books that I'm writing. Um, one of them is about nuclear-powered aircraft. So um, back in the 1950s, the U.S. spent about a billion dollars trying to build a nuclear-powered airplane. They thought this would be, you know, the the ideal weapon to some degree. It could circle endlessly above the USSR. This was right in the middle of the Cold War. Circle above, always ready to drop nuclear weapons. Um, and at the same time, it was a very, very bifurcated project. There was a group of scientists who said, okay, we're gonna use this as a new method of transportation. We'll be able to carry people around the world and, and reunite this world that was recently torn apart by World War II and was still kind of split by the Cold War. Um, this project did not succeed for a variety of reasons, not least of which that it was technically impossible, but also the scientists working on it itself had such different views of, of what they wanted to do with the technology. Um, and I, I just found it so fascinating because it's sort of like a microcosm of the nuclear industry itself. It's just this interplay of creative forces versus destructive forces versus going up against technical impossibility that I just found it fascinating to dig into. So how did you kind of stumble across the story? So I, well, I know you have a background in nuclear energy, but um, did any unique way that that story came across your desk? Oh, yeah. So um, a little bit of necessary background. So um, I have a PhD in nuclear engineering. And for about eight years, I ran um, one of the first nuclear reactor designed startups called Transatomic Power. So we were working on commercializing a new type of nuclear reactor that would leave behind a lot less nuclear waste than existing designs. It would be safer, cheaper, um, have all of these technical benefits. Mm -hmm. That did not work out. But um, we discovered some interesting things along the way. Um, so the type of design that my company's reactor was initially based on um, actually evolved out of um, the reactor that they were initially going to use for the nuclear powered aircraft. So it was a type of design that was exceptionally um, safe, uh, very, very reliable, um, had a very good power to weight ratio. So they were planning mm -hmm. on, you know, putting these, like, you know, basically onto a, a modified B-52 aircraft, um, which is bonkers. It's the craziest thing in the entire it, world. Um, it is insane. So, I, I did look up some of the CIA. Um, when you told me about this the first time, I looked it up uh, and you can see some of the CIA stuff about it. It's it's actually such a, a wild and crazy idea. Yeah, and actually part of it, to digress a little bit, um, yeah. the reason, one of the main reasons the U.S. kept putting so much funding into it is because they had thought the Soviet Union was putting a lot of funding into it as well. The Soviet mm -hmm. Union was funding it because they thought the U.S. was funding it. So it was just also this encapsulation of a Cold War arms race where they were both putting money into this project that was nuts for a wide range of reasons, but neither side felt like they were strategically able to step down. So you, so you um, kind of were digging into this project because it was technically it was relevant for transatomic from, for some of the design stuff. That you yes. Guys were thinking so about. Um, this, this type of reactor that they initially developed for the nuclear powered aircraft program, they eventually realized that, you know, while it wouldn't be suited for powering airplanes, because nothing would be, it actually had some great applications for land based power. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And later on, sort of in uh, the mid to late 1960s, there was a test facility for this type of reactor built at the Oak Ridge National Lab. They proved out its great safety benefits but it was expensive, it required weapons grade uranium as fuel, um, they eventually canned the project. So what my company was working on was adapting that design, allowing it to run on low and rich nuclear fuel, um, making it be a lot cheaper and, and a few other benefits besides so that. I so I'd, like, I'd always just felt this love for the nuclear powered aircraft project because it was yeah, like, yeah. in addition to being, I don't know, this combination of like optimism and like 
weird, terrible destruction. And I just found the contradictions inherent in that to be very, very interesting. But at the same time, it was sort of the, the origin story of, of the technology that I spent so much of my life working on. Okay, so there's really two threads that I want to follow. And the mm -hmm. first one is, um, I want to like dig in more to that the story that that what captivated you and how you're continuing to research it. But then I want to talk about how that kind of influenced um, Transatomic and then that story too. So starting with the, with the with the first. Um, so, you know, you, I'm, I'm assuming you kind of were spending a lot of time with kind of the technical aspects. And now that you're, you know, thinking about turning this into a book form, you're spending, I would assume more time on some of the, like the social and the people. Is that, is that how it's shaking out? Very much so. So I had a good handle, um, you know, from my previous research of knowing where all of the technical reports were. And, you know, yeah. even in the early days of the project, we were able to talk with some of the older emeritus scientists at Oak Ridge about their work and, you know, find out some of the things that didn't make it into the report. Things like, oh, you know, you don't want to use like fine threaded, um, you know, bolts on this type of design because the salt will creep up it. So you need to use coarse threading or something like all of these like minutiae of like little things that went wrong. So I had a good handle on the technical side, but now digging into the politics that drove a lot of that kind of m makes the whole thing come into much clearer focus. So um, where do you go to kind of unearth the that side of it all the all the politics that went into it i mean is that are these interviews that you're conducting are people still around um how, how where do you find it so unfortunately now um most of these people aren't around anymore but um there there are a few places that i was able to go for um uh for some additional sources on the politics side so one of the more interesting ones is that fairly recently, just over the past uh, 15 years or so, a lot of the uh, congressional hearings and government reports surrounding this were declassified. So, um, and you know, none of them were like too groundbreaking, you know, now that it's been decades since the end of the Cold War, like none of these are big secrets anymore, but you can read in right. and say, oh, like this senator, you know, had this perspective and he had these people within um, his particular district. And so this is why he was, you know, figuring this out. And, you know, this other senator was like pounding the table with his fist and like swearing at it and calling the airplane literally like a giant shitbird because, um, you know, he felt that congressional funds were being misspent on it. So like a big source of data and like really getting into the, the personal motivations for um, the Congress people and you know some of the scientists and some of the administrators from the national labs, I was able to get directly from the transcripts of some of these hearings that were declassified fairly recently. Wow. It's so awesome. how, so what's made, can you share like one anecdote that, that's come from that that's been kind of like surprising or sticks with you? I mean, one piece that, I didn't fully appreciate before is that how much of this was driven by um, differences of, of opinion within different branches of the armed services. Um, so, for example, the Army put in a significant amount of funding to this, and the Air Force did as well. Um, and a lot of this was because the basically the Air Force wanted to become a separate branch from the armed services, which it wasn't um, until partway into the start of this work. And they said, okay, well, if we have, if we have nuclear powered aircraft, that makes us different from the other branches. This will give us additional political power. This will, you know, help us achieve some of our other goals. Um, and I, I really didn't understand that at all until I started reading these reports directly. Interesting. So all in all, how much did they spend on this? Do you have a ballpark? It was a uh, ballpark $1.2 billion um, in, I think that's tied to like 1958. Wow. Wow. So it was a big project. Yeah. Um, so what, um, you know, it's kind of, kind of stamped and labeled as a failure. Would you say that the project, like it didn't, didn't work? Very much so. So after, um, basically the project ended when the Kennedy administration came in and they said, just, no, we're not pouring any more money into this work. We've, we've done enough. Um, and more specifically, they had intercontinental ballistic missiles by that point. So they didn't need airplanes that could continually circle above the USSR. They could just 
send an ICBM. Um, and, you know, there were some scathing reports from the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, saying, look at all this money that was wasted, like, look at all of the hours of the scientists' time that was spent on this when it could have been spent, you know, developing ICBMs or something, I guess. Um, and it was it was viewed as a loss and it really tarred the careers of a number of the administrators um, on the national lab side uh, who, had, who had pushed for it. Um, but what was interesting to me, in, in the years following and the decades following, there was a lot of good that emerged from it. So a mm -hmm. lot of the reactor technology, for example, that they worked on um, went on to be really useful to the rest of the nuclear industry. So like molten salt reactors, for example, came out directly mm. of this work in the aircraft reactor experiment. Um, and then similarly, a lot of work in high temperature steel alloys um, that were used throughout um, not just the nuclear industry, but in the aircraft and aerospace industry as well. And just a whole slew of other really interesting advanced materials research, like the, um, the heat shielding tiles that were used hmm. on the space shuttles were developed um, directly out of this program as well. So I think there's been perhaps a bit of a shift that there's a sense that like, even though, even though this project wasn't able to achieve its direct goal, it still was good scientific research and good eventually came out of it. Interesting. So th it's like the, the long good of a, of a, big ambitious um, project, even though, you know, kind of at the time it didn't achieve its goal. That's interesting. Yeah, that's, that's how I think of it. It wasn't able to achieve its specific goal, but it, it was good scientific work and it eventually did good for the world on these multi-decade timescales. Okay. So this kind of is, is interesting because it, um, you know, and I'm sure you've drawn this parallel already, is it kind of parallels your story. It does. So, and can, what's hilarious, though, is that I was, I was working on this book for like six months before it dawned on me in the slightest um, that there were perhaps some parallels between this and my previous nuclear company beyond the, you know, the fact that it's very similar reactor technology. Um, can you do, I, can you tell, can you do a short, oh, like, the, a short story of transatomic and um, specifically kind of how it how you've decided to end it with, with open sourcing it. Absolutely. Um, so reactor design company transatomic power uh, working on commercializing a molten salt reactor. Um, we realized after after many years of working on this, after raising several rounds of venture capital funding, that well, and also after undergoing some significant tech challenges and tech redesigns, we realized that we weren't going to be first to market. We weren't going to be second to market. We weren't going to be third to market. The, the technology was good, but the business case for us just wasn't there anymore. Hmm. And it just seemed wrong for me to continue taking investor money. So um, hmm. I ended up calling up my investors and asking them if I could do something kind of, kind of radical and kind of outside of the box. So um, would I propose that we do, and this is what we ended up doing, um, was open source all of our technology. So relinquish all of our patents, put all of our design out into the public domain. Um, after many, many conversations with the National Nuclear Security Agency and the DOE, because that was very, very necessary, uh, we actually put all of our reactor design up onto GitHub, um, where it is to this day. Um, and we wanted it up there so that other people could use it. And yeah. what's been really pleasant is that people actually are using it right now. So there are a number of different university research groups, um, also groups within uh, ARPA-E, which is a, a branch of the US Department of Energy, are taking our reactor design um, and incorporating pieces of it into their own work. Um, it's also being used as a sort of a test bed for um, analyzing some new types of uh, nuclear security procedures for advanced reactors because 
you can imagine like, okay, so if you're trying to like poke holes in the security plan of, an, of a type of reactor, you don't want to use an existing reactor design. But if you have a fully fleshed out reactor design that's not going to get built, that's really, really ideal for saying, okay, well, here are the weak spots in this part of the, the processing system, you know, here's the potential mm. vulnerability. And then you can adapt best practices from that and bring it to mm. um, the rest of the similar class of designs that are out there. So it's been, it's been gratifying in a way that it's actually, that the technology is, is living on. So wow, perhaps there's some parallels there with the nuclear oh, oh, power aircraft project. It sounds like it. Um, you know, I was kind of thinking about this interview and I was kind of starting to make those connections in my head and I said, wow, this is, this, this really is a perfect um, project for you to be um, reporting on. So I want to kind of, uh, you know, in this, Kind of podcast what we, we usually do is spend some time talking about what um, the process is for doing research like how you're actually um, taking notes so you're, you're going through these transcripts um, this is one of the ways that you mentioned that um, are you um, how, how are you like translating those into notes and 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 putting those into like the shape of a the shape of a book one of the things that I started doing fairly early on when I was making the transition from, you know, just viewing the scientific data to understanding more about the, the motivations of the people who were, you know, doing this work and funding this work and fighting over this work, um, I, I started, you know, thinking about the individual people as individual characters, really, mm -hmm. and just, you know, made a list of like, here are all of the people involved. Here are, you know, say the the 150 people who are most important to this story. And I tried to get a sense of just where, like where they were coming from, like, and even, even quite literally, like where they were born, what was their educational background? What were they doing in World War II? What were they doing in World War I? How did that shape their perspective on, national security, on nuclear power, on nuclear weapons, on funding different branches of the military. And that's, and that's been interesting. Wow, that sounds almost like a, like a technique from, from movie writing or script writing. <laughs> um, I actually- Where does that, go ahead. So go ahead. I, I have no, like, I have no formal training like on in that type of writing at all. Um, that came about because completely by chance I had a um, a really, really interesting conversation um, uh, with the author of King Leopold's Ghost, Adam Hothschild. And I, I asked him about, you know, his writing process, about how he structures it. And he said he, you know, he thinks about it as, as going scene by scene. And like, that is how you build up, um, a narrative arc that is how you draw people in to stories that otherwise could you know fall out of people's consciousness pretty quickly and i i just thought that was fascinating i had never thought to view nonfiction in that way interesting well i i, I it makes sense and and I, I love the idea of these kind of of seeing the background so what does that look like do you have like a spreadsheet or do you have like a and each person has their own kind of document or what is what is what are the visuals of this so right now it's an absolute mess of just word documents um and a handful okay. of spreadsheets that are, that are in place so i ended up looking into uh there are like a half dozen or so different types of software that are specifically for um either doing screenwriting or like novel writing where you can like put in the individual characters, but none of them quite worked the way I wanted to. And I, I flirted with the idea of just writing my own before deciding, before realizing that that would just be a way of procrastinating on like doing the actual work that I wanted to do. So now it's, it's just the most ugly, god awful mess of Word documents and like links to annotated PDFs and, and things along those lines. So, so I unfortunately still, don't have anything pretty to show. It, well, that's all right. I, th I think that's the, the the common thing I hear is that um, research is messy for a lot yeah. of folks, and um, and that's the kind of the interesting part about it is is first making a mess and then trying to, to trying to clean it up. I like uh, that. Yeah. I mean, one thing that's been really helpful for me also actually um, 
before the pandemic, I was able to talk a lot in person with research librarians at various institutions that were connected to some of the people in the story. And, you know, the resources out there were absolutely staggering. Um, so, you know, one of the people heavily involved in all of this is uh, Veniver Bush, who um, headed up, who's, you know, one of the historical figures whom I admire very, very greatly. So he um, headed up a lot of uh, the U.S.'s um, uh, research and development throughout World War II. I mean, also, sure. I mean, yeah, I, you know, I mean, the essays he that he published the that he foretold the, the internet in, yeah. you know, in the Endless 1940s. frontier, and as we yeah. think, all of this. Yep. Um, and uh, I, I went to MIT's research librarians and they said, oh yeah, we have, you know, some of his correspondence and it's actually like organized. So we have like his correspondences with like various heads of, um, the Atomic Energy Commission, predecessor to the U.S. Department of Energy, like all throughout uh, the 1950s and the early 1960s. So of course, like have access to all of these boxes of documents. So it's like 31 cubic feet of his correspondence with these various people. Yeah. Wow. So I've read through some of them. And as soon as I um, am able to go back to Cambridge, I'll be able to read through uh, more oh, of the rest of them that aren't so digitized. What, what was his role in this? Was he a proponent, an instigator, uh, funder, all of the above? Um, initial funder, and then had significant doubts about this project. He was basically on several of the government advisory committees that were, hmm. um, well, advising the senators and other Congress people on how much funding should be allocated for this, um, and also advising the the presidents who were involved in this project as well. Um, initial funding, then severe doubts, especially when he saw that the uh, Navy's nuclear powered submarine project was going exceptionally well. You know, submarines are, are great to be powered by nuclear power. And mm. he was advocating quite strongly by the end of it to withdraw funding for this. But he also was one of the first people to realize that there was great work going on um, at the national labs adjacent to this project as well. So, so interesting. So like jumping back to the project, so there was competition from the Soviets. There was also competition from the Navy. Yes, so there was a, a number of drivers. So. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, um, Admiral Rickover um, on the Navy side was, you know, he both had technology on his side because nuclear reactors are far better suited to powering submarines than they are airplanes. But Rickover was also a master at administrating this type of large scale project. So it was, it's like shining success was very much in, in contrast with a lot of the technical hurdles that were facing the nuclear powered aircraft project. Um, one other thing about Rickover actually, just to interject that I, that I find so touching, like, um, Throughout just about all of his correspondence um, from the 1940s onwards, when he's talking about, say, um, you know, needing to increase funding uh, for, you know, for universities to train the next generation of nuclear engineers, he he doesn't just refer to male nuclear engineers. He said he 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 refers to like potential male and female nuclear engineers. So like, you know, for you know, he or she who will become like, you know, the next class of, of great nuclear scientists. And it's, That's great. it's really lovely, actually. It was unexpectedly quite moving to see that from him. Well, that's awesome. That's great. Um, one of the things I do in this, in these conversations is I always ask people what their best idea is for, for making science better. And I want to ask you that, like with a, um, kind of a blank check and open slate. You can answer it however you want. But before, one of the things I'm, I'm curious to ask you that may fit into that box is um, what are the lessons here um, for like the current kind of science administration? to kind of administering administrating these bigger projects i mean what what can they kind of what lessons did they learn and what could they learn what do you think they should be taking away from it that's interesting and that's i mean i think that gets into the really thorny problem of 
how much should we as a country be spending on national defense? Because mm -hmm. I think that, you know, right now, um, and potentially in the past as well, the US's budget for national defense and like research into national defense was far too high. But at the same time, there's so much interesting science that came out of it. So it's completely unclear as to mm. where you ought to be drawing the line there. And I'm not sure if, I don't think anyone has learned the right lessons from that because defense spending has been increasing you know, year over year just by, by ridiculous amounts. And mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I think one of the lessons learned, you know, back in the 1950s um, and in the 1940s and in the subsequent decades all throughout the Cold War as well, um, and a lot of this was headed up by the Negro Bush, is, um, you know, get, <laughs> get the U.S. government to, you know, spend as much on defense as possible, like some amount of that money can flow into universities and maybe some good can potentially come out of it, but it's, that, that, is an absolute knot that needs to be untangled. And I don't have a good, neat solution for that. I don't even have a good, neat way of stating the problem even. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was just, um, I spent some time rereading uh, Vannevar Bush's Endless Frontier, mm -hmm. which I think is in many ways like the founding document for the, the current scientific paradigm that we live in. And, um, you know, it's interesting because it's not like, you know, a lot of people think of that document and they think, oh, we should just, science can, we need to fund lots of science and there's, it's going to be good forever. But, the, but it's very goal oriented if you, if you read it, right? It's like curing mm -hmm. disease, national security, um, creating full employment. Um, so that, that's one interesting thing that I took away from that is like, um, you know, academics are kind of sometimes I think want to feel like they just need freedom to follow their curiosity wherever it may lead. But the kind of the, the research, the goals of the, this research paradigm that we're currently in, we're, we're very much um, kind of goal oriented. So anyways, I thought that was interesting. That, that is really neat. And I think it's a combination and this like a combination of being goal oriented and having a strong understanding of the morality perhaps that surrounds it and so that kind of existed as as guideposts hmm. for the technology and where things can get tricky and i mean and this has happened quite frequently throughout the past as well is where the technology sort of leapfrogs like our collective moral understanding of what that technology means and you know one huge example of course is um the development of nuclear bombs. And then, and even now there are similar examples of like, well, we can develop really, really good AI, but what does that mean? If you develop AI that determines who's gonna skip bail, then <laughs> like you clearly don't want to implement that, but you need to get people to understand why you don't want to implement that and the inherent moral problems and technical problems and how the two of those um, dovetail perhaps. Yeah, it's something that you, I, th I think, um, you're you're forced. That issue is is front and center when you're dealing with um, kind of nuclear nuclear energy. I know there's such a like a visceral, like public response, like for it or against it, um, that you that you really do have to address that. Is that? Yeah, is that I think true? coming from nuclear, that moral element has always yeah. been at the forefront of my mind because it was, you know, it was one of the first things that the Los Alamos scientists did after, um, after the bomb was dropped on, on Hiroshima and then on Nagasaki, they, you know, figured out, they put together a committee um, for figuring out the moral implications of this work and where the mo moral guideposts should be for all of this. Cause they were to some degree just so shocked by what they had done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, well, I want to go like go back and make sure that I ask you that question with the, the blank slate. So what are what are your best ideas for making science better? Open access to journals, I'd say more than anything, because um, I found when when I'm doing work, you know, both 
uh, to some degree work on my books, but also work on some of the other new, like more, you know, pure science and technology projects that I'm working on. Um, the, the way that I do research is I go into Google Scholar and I look up every single journal article, like, possibly related to my topic and I'm exceptionally lucky because I still have access um, you know via my former university to these articles um, but otherwise it would be you know like thousands of dollars a day these articles are like you know $35 or $55 a pop to download and like I can't imagine even how someone would be able to do work without that type of immediate access to everyone else's publications. Well, that I hear here. I I love that. Um, but so, uh, but I also kind of just learned something about you in your research process. So, so this is how you take on a new a new topic. You go on to Google Scholar, find every paper. Do you print them out and then just kind of sit down and go through them, or what's your what do you do from there? For for the good ones, I print them out and I annotate them in. Um, there we go. My color coded pens. So for what is the color? Yeah, what's the color code? Oh, it's a, it's actually, it's not a super detailed code. It's just black is typically for like, you know, my own thoughts that are typically like, why? I don't understand why they're doing this. Leslie, find another article that explains this in more detail. And uh, red are super interesting things. And blue is in case they're super interesting things, but I need it to contrast from the red. It's okay, not a very got detailed it. system. Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> And so then you mark them up and then you keep them like you have like a, you have like a file system where you're keeping all of these or you just process uh, them and then throw them away. So usually I keep them in a manila file folder. I have some that go back to, um, gosh, some of my work in undergrad. Um, I spent a lot of time in undergrad actually with MIT's archaeology department researching and then eventually building ancient Ecuadorian style balsa rafts. I forget if we've talked about this before, but I still have no. a pile of articles about different types of ancient Ecuadorian balsa rafts and uh, ways to build things out of wood and ways to keep balsa wood from decomposing. So I, I lugged these around for, for a long period of time, like this was, you know, 16 years ago plus that I was working on this. Um, Do you, and you still have them? I still have them, yeah. And so I brought them from apartment to apartment, from coast to coast over 16 years. Because, like, what if why don't I just, I'm fond of them. I, I a little hey, bit of a make, pack rat. It makes sense. So, so is this just like a wall of, of, of manila folders, like a file cabinets and things like that? Yeah, I can show it to you if I can move my camera. So, it's, right, um, cool. they, for the most, oh, this is very blurry. Hang on, some of it's there. And most of it, there we go. Yeah, most of it kind of lives. Got it. Like there, pretty much. It's all fire. It all looks like it's fire there. safe too. Ish, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Um, there we go. All right, cool. Well, that is. Um, <laughs> that's that's exactly what I wanted to know. Um, cool. All right. Well, um, and then you have a few other research projects you had kind of hinted at. You want to give a short overview of those? Oh, totally. I'll talk about the other book and... Perfect. That's great. Little, yeah, that'll, that'll work. Okay. So um, I'm really interested in things that operate at large scale. And in particular, I'm interested in power production. But if you want everyone to have reliable access to power, it's, it's not just power production that you have to fix. Mm -hmm. You have to fix the entire electric infrastructure. A lot of it, like you just have to fix the grid in, in the US especially, um, just like the, the high transmission lines and the distribution lines and the different types of substations are, are kind of falling apart. Like they, um, uh, the, the companies that maintain them completely slash the budget for, you know, maintaining transmission lines for, you know, even trimming the trees around your transmission lines, which has led to some of the disastrous wildfires in California every year for the past three, four plus years. Um, and what was frustrating to me as I dug into this more is that I couldn't find any good explanations for how the electric grid works. Like I was thinking, you know, what if, what if you put a lot of intermittent sources? Like what if you get solar to work even better? What if you get wind to work even better? Like what are, what are the limitations if you want to increase the amount of intermittent renewable sources that are out there? And there was no good explanation that I could find anywhere for how the system works. So um, hmm. I decided with a friend of mine that we would write our own. And um, because we were feeling a little bit like petulant 
perhaps at the time, and she also is um, a well-regarded best-selling children's book author, we decided that we would write our, you know, authoritative overview of how the U.S. electric grid works. We would write it in the form of a children's mystery novel um, mm. in which a... <laughs> Um, a 10-year-old girl named Adeline, who lives in the suburbs of Houston, Texas, um, there are some problems with the electric grid in her community. There's, there's a power surge. It burns down the shed in her parents' backyard where she keeps all of her science equipment. No one believes her when she says it's a power surge. They think that, you know, her dad thinks that maybe she left a hot plate plugged in, and, but of course she wouldn't do that. She is a good scientist. So she sets out mm -hmm. to clear her name figure things out with the insurance company. And in the process, she learns how the entire U.S. electric grid works. <laughs> oh my gosh. So that that's sounds the like other so thing that I'm working fun. on. It is so much fun. Wow. So yeah. um, what is that? So what does that research look like? Um, how are you piecing together the grid, first of all? So a lot of it, like I've, done some work in the past like with the various uh regulatory regulatory authorities within the u.s yeah. who manage different parts of the grid so just i mean to some degree i just called up some of the people that i knew within the industry and was like so yeah. this is my understanding is is this correct am i like do i have a good sense of what your job actually is and how your job interfaces with other people and you know i've read yeah. and and a lot of it was just like googling news articles about various ways in which the grid has broken in various ways in which the existing grid is fragile. And, you know, there are a million stories like that out there. Like, you know, just a few weeks ago, there was, um, is this in Colorado? This sounds like Colorado. You know, a, a bird of prey dropped a rattlesnake onto a substation and it shorted out like, you know, several cities in Colorado. Um, there are a lot of weaknesses within the electric grid. So it was kind of like mapping yeah. those true stories, um, huh. you know, figuring out which ones would be interesting and applicable in fiction, and then cross-checking them by talking to people who actually work within the industry. Okay, I, I can't wait to read it. Thank you. That one, I, I can't wait to read um, both of these, actually. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm also kind of just looking forward to seeing what you continue to do and make and, and create, because it's always, fun and it's always interesting and important. So thanks for all you're doing. Thank you so much, David. Really, really good talking with you about all of this. All right. Take care. Thanks. You too. Bye.